Okay, so let me start straight away. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me here. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be able to speak here today and be uh, in Berlin. And uh, I'd like to connect more or less seamlessly to the talk we heard before and would like to give you some insight on um, lessons learned, uh, pitfalls, traps to avoid, um, things, f how from my perspective an open source community can work out. And of course, you always need to read that in, in a specific context. This is uh, 10 items that I identified. They are uh, not conclusively, depending on which kind of project, what your background is, um, what your um, what your project's goals is, these things could be different. But this is what we learned. Uh, we, that is the, the LibreOps project that I'm, I'm part of. And I hope that provides some benefit for the work you do, some some more insights, some things. So I'm I'm in the whole feed for like 16 years, and um, as you know, with the with the LibreOffice area, a lot of things have changed, have developed, and are constantly developing. And so there's a there's a couple of things. So uh, my my official role is that I'm executive di director of the Document Foundation, that is the entity behind LibreOffice, and I was there from the beginning. So I was one of the founders and was also back in the days with the OpenOffice Org project, and seen everything developing over the course of time and and how the whole area changed, and. Um, it, I tried to share a couple of bits and pieces from from that time. So one of the uh, when when we have job interviews uh, at the Document Foundation, one of the more interesting questions for the candidates is like, what is a community? And we get a, a ton of actually pretty good answers. One candidate once started to to uh, paint that on on a paper. So everybody has a slightly different understanding of what it is. And one that I like a lot and that is uh, taken from the uh, German Wikipedia article that talks about a group of people, which we had heard before. It, it's made out of actual people. We are, we are not in the phase yet that we have AI running the show. Um, shared identity, I think, is key. And joint interests. And it already starts with the question, a uh, group of people, what is their background? So... You can be there in a pure private capacity, private contributors. In, in the LibreOffice project, we have a lot of these. You can be there solidly with your corporate hat. Or, and this is what we see more and more, that uh, of course more and more people have jobs that are related to open source, to free software, and they contribute more and more. So it's, it's not mutually exclusive. That, that kind of thing, that you either are a corporate contributor or uh, uh, in a private capacity. In the end, um, a company doesn't act, people act. And so in the end, it doesn't matter so much who is, um, or would, what, what is your background. You're part of that community. And what we've learned is that is quite critical to to have those common memory things you can talk about, like a bit with old school friends. You have memories you can share. And uh, at least for us in the LibreOffice project, that is one of the key things that when you meet people you haven't seen for a long time, that there are things you, you remember, things, common feelings, common events that you attended, something that unites you, that builds that kind of group feeling that is uh, rather important. What I don't like so much is that I think these days the term community is actually quite abused. So you have any random food producer running a website with a forum or a chat and it's immediately a community. Might be in a technical sense, but this is not what I am addressing. To me, it, it's a bit more. So I think kind of the, the marketing that is done these days, you have all sorts of communities around washing powder and, and whatnot. Um, that's not the term that I would use here. But I mean, fair enough, it's, uh, it's simply what we see. And um, yeah. Um, no, I think the if you, if you look the the, the it, it's not depth enough usually. So the the usual websites that have those those random groups, it's around uh, one specific product. It's usually just in one direction. You barely can influence what is happening. You're just the consumer end. And in a in a true open source community, you can influence. You can take a role. So if I'm on that website of the washing powder, I usually can't influence the marketing. If I'm in an open source project, I have, in an ideal world at least, much higher chances to do that. 
So yes, you guard around a specific thing, but you're on the on the receiving end. You you cannot be a creator. It's it's a broad definition indeed, and uh, there 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 are many more. And I think you always exclude something or someone. So uh, I haven't yet found a proper definition. That that's why I said during the interviews we get a lot of great ideas, and I'd like to combine all of these in one big sentence. But um, I, if if anybody has a better better definition, I'd like to hear that. It's not so trivial actually. I, I agree. You could base that onto or match that with the definition, but the, the sense behind that, the, the you can be enabled, you, you can take part, which we will see, is missing from that. So it is some sort of community, but not what I have in mind with that at least. When you think about how is it organized, it, it's some sort of creative chaos. So many, many years ago, I think, could could be 15 years back in the Open Office Org project, we tried indeed to paint a picture of a community. And in the end, we ended up with an ant hill. You have all those ants running in different directions, and it looks super chaotic. In the end, something comes out of that. But per se, there is not so much structure. And this is what many projects these days organize, that you have some more structure, some more leadership, some more goals that you share, some more identity. And we had the people, it gets even more exciting, which of course with my background is a, is a part of what I want to tell you, is when you have an organization involved, be it a commercial entity, be it uh, like what the Document Foundation is, a non-profit, because all of a sudden, apart from all the human factors that you have, a lot of organizational things come on top. Uh, you have to deal with donations with funds and not having money is a problem but having money can also be a problem you need to deal with that you need to organize that you need to spend it and coordinate that you will in an organization have certain roles that could be a board that could be a advisory board it could be a treasurer that could be spokesperson and as such that is then subject to certain rules, to elections. So there's a framework around that that people have to stick to. And that can make things even more complicated. Um, the, the separation or distinction between the roles here is not conclusive. So for me, formal roles are those that you need to have that fill a formal role. Like in a nonprofit, you have a board. You need to have that. Then you often have more dynamic roles that could be people taking a certain role um, that is not formalized like uh, being a marketing spokesperson but that differs you also have projects and organizations that have a dedicated role for that but there are more formalized roles that have other rules other regulations other uh, structures and there are more flexible roles that can be rather easily awarded or are rather easily awarded um, than, than others and what still holds true, at least from the projects I know, that uh, we are always short on volunteers. So if you're not running away fast enough, it's, it's rather easy to get a certain role or to get a certain task assigned at least. You might not be immediately on a board, but getting a certain task, getting certain duties and some sort of role is rather happens rather quickly, I, I think. But then with taking some some more roles, some more leadership um, in a project, you also take over certain responsibilities and there are certain things to avoid. And this is what I'm trying uh, in the next slides to break down on, on 10 items that I identified that we learned, that I personally learned over the, the last couple of years, things that we ran into, things that we had to deal with, things that for us work out. Your experience might be a different one, fair enough, but this is some of the things that I could extract from. So what has happened? We are uh, at a certain point. Why is that? And, and what could we have avoided? What uh, would we have wished to have learned up front? So the first thing, especially if you're in an organization with a, with a large group, with a larger board, it's usually not clear with whom you are running. So it's not that you likely run for a board role and have like three people that you run with, but it's an election. So you might indeed end up with someone you don't like. You can hardly work with. That's that's a risk. It's, it's not different than in a company. You might go to a department and there are people you get along with and people you don't get along with. So 
what we have learned is that cooperation is essential and that needs to take place in a in a certain way. Um, I mean, it, it all sounds trivial, but for us, it's always good to remind ourselves again of of those those golden rules. Um, you need to communicate open and honestly, especially if you're in a volunteer capacity and you don't see each other in the same office each day, you work remotely, then that is actually rather important. Transparency, especially for the Document Foundation, is one of the key things that we set up. So transparency for us is very, very important. So the communication, the cooperation should happen in that fashion. Don't underestimate effectiveness. If you are just discussing for the sake of discussing, you will first achieve nothing, and second, it is damn exhausting. And that's what happens frequently. You just argue and discuss, and it turns especially into email, into a massive amount of, of messages that serve essentially no purpose than just to you know speak your soul free, but it's not, it's not productive. So especially if you spend spare time, you want to create something, you want to see something, and not just end up in, in pointless discussions. It's not possible to avoid it completely. We are all humans. But I think it's it's a rather important thing to keep in mind that if you work in an effective way, it also in the end will give you more, more pleasure and more joy in what you do. Then what I mentioned, you can work or you can end up with people in a, in a certain group with whom you might not get along immediately. So you need to identify a few cute things that you have in common because if you work together, you need to share something. Otherwise, it's rather pointless. Um, talking about goals or, or vision or plans is important. But the second step is often missing. You have to, all those great goals, but who's going to pursue them? Who is in charge? Who wears the hat? That does not necessarily mean doing everything yourself, but uh, checking, driving it, reporting it, feeling mandated to, to push a topic forward. And that is key because the first step is easy. We want to achieve the following things, but who's going to wear the hat on this? And the second step is, especially in the beginning of a project, often missing and can lead to some rather unpleasant experiences. A key thing is also different points of view. It's normal and it's actually good to have different points of view. Sometimes it's a bit like salt in the soup. Without, it's not tasty. If it's too much, it's horrible. So you need to find a proper balance to, to get along, to align the views or to, to end up with something you can all share. And more than once, especially if you work with people from other countries, from other cultures, you will get a new perspective at some point. And you will try to question yourself, try to understand others. And that, in the end, can lead to a much bigger choice than you had on your screen before. Because you, you, you see something else, you get some more input. And um, in the beginning for us, that was rather exhausting because we were already quite busy with what we were doing. But then we learn to value and appreciate that more and more. So I think it's really key. And of course, you end up with, with certain compromises. You need to find certain things you all share, you want to work on. And also goals, they are not always exclusive. You might have different goals. Sometimes they are simply exclusive, but sometimes they are not. And acknowledging that and Uh, trying to sound out what is possible and what could actually work together quite well is also one of the rather challenging tasks, I'd say. And the picture I have, if, if you play the game of rope pulling, so you have actually people enjoying the same thing. They're even on two different sides in the game, but some resistance is important. In the end, it's important you have a, a great time together and even if you disagree on, on a couple of things, that's fine. Uh, but you should be able to play at least the same sports. That's That's important. The second point, I name it commitment. Because first, you if, if you are mandated with a more formal role, with more responsibility, you get there because of your previous commitment. But then it also means you have more commitment in the future. That's a point that I find rather important. So, of course, sometimes there's just a, a vacant seat and you take it, fair enough. But um, you likely will not get a certain responsibility or appreciation of what you do if, if you haven't been seen before, if you were not present, acting a specific way, recognized by people, appreciated by people. So usually it's an expression of trust, whether explicit or implicit, but that's something you should make yourself clear. 
sometimes fair enough there's just uh, a seat free and people look for someone to fill that but more and more and and it's in the majority of uh, of of cases that you have a certain reputation a positive one and that's is what you should make yourself aware however what i think is rather important to understand if like if you get elected into a board it is not only because you did a great job and now this is your medal that you can wear and that's it no actually comes with a ton of other and additional work and what i want to emphasize this work can be completely unrelated from what you have done before so if you were in marketing if you were in development and all of a sudden you're on a board maybe part of that role is oversight over these areas but you will have a ton of other work that is completely unrelated and so it, it's not just the, the laurels you get and you can wear proudly but there is more attached to it there, there there are strings attached and this is what i think when people run for such a role especially in a large organization is really key to understand looking at the time that is required it, it's really hard to say it completely depends on the organization what we did uh, at the document foundation is to estimate over a year what is so to speak the minimum amount of time you have to invest for a role and we ended up with like 15 to 20 working days that is quite a lot actually over the course of, of the year so um, it shouldn't keep prevent you from running for a specific role but you should make yourself clear there's more work coming on top that requires a certain commitment so why is that because variety sounds rather positive what I want to highlight is what could be a part of the role. This, this is now a slide that is rather specific for for formal board. But now imagine you have a mix of developers, of QA people, of marketeers, of localizers, of infrastructure people. And it's all great, but what you see here is a ton of the tasks that they might end up with dealing on a daily business, or at least overseeing on a daily business. So there is uh, a lot of new information you might have to digest. And we just seen that we just started with a new board at the Document Foundation. Usually I, I do the onboarding, explaining a bit what's going on, what are the areas. And that list and that amount of emails we sent for the onboarding basically grows every two years when we have the new set of board running. And it, it's really, it's not getting easier. I mean, we have new regulations, we have new issues. And what can be frustrating is that while all of that is required, it's barely visible in public. It's nothing that is like makes you a rock star. You walk on the red carpet and people applaud for that. It's the, the boring groundwork that needs to be done that is not really glamorous. And that can be in the beginning a bit frustrating when you have a lot of work and people don't uh, see what is going on. But it heavily depends on the organization, the size of organization, obviously. Um, but this is what we learned rather the hard way. So to deal with all of that, it's, I think, basic knowledge to be able to learn. You, you should be open. You cannot have all of that completely on your table and be completely sophisticated in all of the areas. That's completely impossible. I mean, everybody has their, their special areas of interest. But you need to get a bit of insight how these kind of things work. You need to be open. There must be some tolerance to frustration. Uh, the onboarding is, is not so easy. It's a steep learning curve. This is what uh, you should keep in mind when, when dealing with that. And then, if you are in a larger group, usually people have different skills. You should identify these and make use of that. Because if you end up doing everything yourself, and you might have an accountant in, in your group or an IT guy, let them do the job that they are actually skilled with. And I mean, it sounds stupid, but we identify that each time when we go through the, the list of people taking care of certain areas, if you ask them, so, What's your, your interest? Where, where are you skilled? People are usually shy. So they can tell you, in, in my day job, I work at an office and I do accounting. But if as a hobby they, I don't know, uh, like to write texts, they might be, might be good for the marketing area. And sounding that out, that they are brave enough to bring it up and say, hey, I have interest in that area. This is something I really feel comfortable with, is not as trivial as it may sound. Because people usually don't run up front and say, uh, I'm great here and I'm great there. They are usually rather shy. It's a bit of kind, uh, I see a shaking head, so a bit of kind of personality, but at least it's the experience that we made that 
at least there is a certain amount of people rather reluctant to like waving the flag and hey, here I am and this is my skill. So sound that out to distribute the tasks and responsibilities accordingly. I think that's rather important. And again, responsibilities. Who is responsible for what? This will likely help you a lot to, to get all the, the influx of tasks done properly. And then at some point, this is what I call delegation, what actually is delegation, it doesn't scale anymore. You need to have others in the boat to help you out. And I know those kind of people who like to work long at night and do everything by yourself to be super competent but actually if you delegate it's not a sign of weakness it's a sign of strength you need to delegate it's impossible in a in a mid to large organization to handle everything yourself that just doesn't fly unless you completely stop sleeping but that has other unpleasant side effects so you can outsource to colleagues to other volunteers you might have employees um, they are service providers and you can share the task and The, the classical areas, as soon as there is some money, there are some resources, what you want to outsource are likely these, these four areas. And IT is a bit, depends on the, on the area you're active. So if you have the skills in-house, you might want to do it in-house. If you don't, it's one of the things to, to first outsource, I guess. But all the, the really, and sorry for, for everybody who is in that field, but I think uh, the fields are simply boring. Nobody really wants to do in their spare time accounting and, and administrative stuff. So this is something you likely want to outsource in the beginning to really have your head free for other important bits and pieces. That's exactly the message. Try to get as soon as you can, rid of smaller tasks, of things that annoy you, of, of micromanaging things that not only sucks, but also only sucks a lot of time. If you are in a more leadership role, if you are there to guide people, if, if you want to run the show, then your goal is really strategy, long-term goals, a vision, where do we want to go, where do we want to be in two, three years, and not dealing with a day-to-day -day business that is, that is not working out. And responsibility is actually the next slide, but you have a certain responsibility all of a sudden that you need to follow and that doesn't fly so well with all the small things that can easily take up your full working day. So what you need to do with all the tasks is to um, be in a position to control what people working with you or for you are delivering, but you can't be expert in all of these. And we, we've seen a lot of times that Oversight is, is important, but you can't go deep. It's, it's simply impossible after a certain amount of, of size. And one of the things, especially in those boring or unknown areas like administration, taxes, and, and uh, all the legal topics that can surround a project these days, um, just because it's not your prime topic and you're not skilled in it, it does not mean it's not important. And especially for those delivering on the tasks, if the perception is always like it's not appreciated, it's not relevant, that can be quite annoying. So keep in mind that even topics you have absolutely no idea of might be of critical relevance for the organization. That is simply simply key. Responsibility is, and with that we are already halfway through, is the fifth item I'd like to talk about. So if you are in an organization, of course there's this maybe larger group, there's a board or a supervisory board or any entity, any body you are part of, and it might be easy to hide and say, yeah, but we are like 10 people here or we are five people or it, it's the big membership or whatever. Um, in the end, if, if you have been mandated for a specific task, you simply have a personal responsibility, maybe not in a legal sense, but at least morally, ethically, uh, towards those who, who gave you trust. So in the end, you need to be um, on, on the safe side. You need to be fine with yourself with what you're doing. And with all the tasks and duties, just to repeat what I said before, try to keep an overview of what's relevant. You cannot be in all of the areas. You cannot cover marketing, development, QA, localization. It's impossible. It doesn't scale. But keep an overview. What is cooking there? What might be pressing points? Um, meet deadlines. They are simply, for, for legal entities, hard deadlines that you have to meet. There is no way around. There's no discussion. Um, regulations. 
they get more and more complicated. I mean, we just had this, this uh, GDPR topic behind us. Th there is many, many more things to come, I'm sure, beyond the, the, the taxes and the, the basic legal stuff. I'm rather sure we will see more things that will take our time and will take our energy and are not directly related to the core thing that any project wants to do. But we have to deal with that. It will not get easier. That's I think that's for sure. And uh, we had the, the interesting experience last year, I think it was, with the uh, changes in, in copyright. And there are always areas that can be a massive problem for, for any project, especially if it's distributed worldwide. So keep that in mind. That is rather important. And again, just because you don't know the topic does not mean it's not important. It might be not important, but it's not a given. So that's something to be aware of. Then, if we talk about project made up of people, of course, there's a massive social component. That's, that's, that's like in any company. And I think with free software projects worldwide, lots of volunteers, different people, that actually is one of the more challenging ones and one of those who really can determine where things are going. Beyond the, the groundwork you need to provide, working together in a, in a team and have a certain sort of responsibility is really, really key. So you might have, and this is what also we discovered over the course of time, you have your tasks and projects, but at some point in time, you might be large enough that you have a paid team. And then you run into the problem that, like in many organizations, you have a pro bono board doing that in their spare time, maybe not having their day business based on guiding people, on handling employees, on the other hand, you have a set of, be it contractors, be it employees, people depending on the organization. And that changes the game quite significantly because all of a sudden you might simply end up in being an employer. It's no different from a small local association that maybe employs one or two people. You take over the, uh, the leadership there and then you are the employer if you like it or not. You might be employed yourself in, in your professional life, but you also have that responsibility of the employer. And that can change things quite a lot. So I, I don't want to deliver a, a lecture on like how to handle staff. There are tons of people who've written great books about that. But the basic two things I think are especially in a, in a, a volatile environment or a changing environment like the communities is give them some safety and provide them a proper work environment, a positive one. It, it can't be all unicorns every day, but try to provide some positive work environment because that is key and that is really important. For you, it might be that side job or side activity you have in the evening, but for them, it maybe is their complete income stream, their complete professional work life. And that is simply a completely different perspective that you have to factor in. And I think especially for a project, you can actually make advantage of what you provide because people then indeed can work from home, which is a, a key benefit. It's not so common still, especially in Germany. Countries are different in that regard, but it's a key thing you can advertise with. Uh, they can turn what they like to do into their day job, into a living contributing to something good, to something positive, not only earning money, but actually moving something, achieving something is something you can sell. So when you write your job offers, don't just have the, the basic facts, but advertise why, why they should go with you. What is the good thing you provide to the world? And I mean, as, as open source communities, we do have things that we want to give to the general public. And therefore, this is something you can really use to advertise and make use of and shout out to the world. If you contribute here, if you join us, actually you do something good and you can uh, m well, make the world a better place. It's such a, a stupid tackle, but you, you know what I mean. You, you can actually contribute to, to something good. As said, it's really a steep learning curve, especially when you do it in a volunteer capacity, especially with volunteer teams, like many projects work with volunteer teams, and that adds another layer of complexity because not everybody is immediately suited for remote. Working from home, not changing the location during the day might be a problem for some, as we have learned. So just listen. It's 
basic knowledge talk with each other, not about each other, try to listen, try to sound out, especially if you don't see people in the office each day, if they're working remotely, if you only infrequently see them, like some members of my team I meet four times a year because they're living on the complete opposite side of the world. And they need, need to really sound out what are they up to, how are they doing, how are they feeling, and that is really, really important. That can earn you, on the other hand, a lot of yeah, motivation and, and loyalty, and this is what we need. If you invest in people, if you build up a team and they run away after a year, you have a problem. You need to build it up again. It costs your time, it costs reputation. So it's, I think, a pretty good investment to do that, to spend time, even if it's hard because it's not your daily job, it's not what you are trained to do. Try to gather some knowledge on how that works and simply be open. I think that especially in a field that we are working in, is one of the um, key competences we should have. Being open, listening, uh, being open-minded, and as such, do that also with your team. That brings me to the topic of diversity. And this is, the larger the project gets, the more exciting that becomes. So we have, looking at people who contribute to, to LibreOffice, we have such a broad range of, of people, broad range of countries, backgrounds, professions, from students uh, to uh, people being retired. Um, we had one of my samples, we had a, um, a doctor, a, a leading doctor who was working in the field of graphics, so completely unrelated to what he was doing in his day job. And that was always a, a quite, for him it was a, a change, he had a talent in that area, for him it was a change to the day job. And um, that's, I mean, that, that's cool. And it requires you to understand certain things. So language, of course, is one one element. Which language do you speak? Or if you're a native English speaker, uh, at what speed do you speak? It, it makes a difference. Can people follow meetings? Can you really bring across the content also in easy words? If you're on the same level, that's fine. But then you might have people who speak basic English and you speak fast and use super complicated words especially in meetings on the phone, that might make a big problem. Culture. Yeah, we have different cultural backgrounds. We might like certain things, we might dislike certain things. And um, religion per se, I mentioned it, is not uh, a key element of the contributions, but it can, like for uh, for the food you have at conferences, makes a difference. Or once we had at our own conference, people were asking, is there a room where we can have prayers? And we simply didn't have that on screen, but for them it was really important. So the more people you have, the more diversity is in, the more you need to to learn and understand. And there are, there are great things you learn that will also advance you personally. At the beginning, it might be a lot of new unknown topics that you have to face. And then, of course, with all the, the great uh, diversity, let's face it, you also have to deal with complicated persons. That's like in daily life, like in a job. So it's not just all the nice people gather here. You also have to face with complicated, with toxic people, with people trying to do harm. And my take is at the moment, this is even going up in the community. So I have a couple of communities I know of that really face struggles at the moment. Might be a coincidence, but in general... There are discussions, there are complicated people you might need to address. It's part of the game. And I made a sample before of local associations. Um, the big difference for me is that much of that might hold true also for a small local organization. The big difference is that in an open source community you have people from around the world and that is rarely the case in a small local association. There might be some people from other countries but it's not this massive influx that you deal with people from 30, 40 countries. So the, the, the level is much higher and the challenges are much higher but then what you can get in return is much higher as well. If you have all those people in, work together with them, that can change the game quite a lot to your advantage. And in the end, the general advice, you need to be open, you need to challenge yourself, you points if you might change, or at least you will learn a new point of view from others, and you need to factor it in. And I personally was 
really positively surprised a couple of times. It's not always easy, like at the conference, so where's the room where we can pray? And you're like, ah, uh, okay. It's just don't have it on screen. For the next conference, you know, you need to reach out and ask if there is such a demand. You can fact it in, you learn something that you will keep. So it's, it's a really helpful thing from my point of view. Speaking about languages, maybe a bit more to the groundwork again on, on how to coordinate all that. So we have projects, we have people, we have different feelings, we have diversity. But how does that more or less technical work, technically work to coordinate everything? And languages is key. Uh, we all assume English is a language spoken everywhere. I might object to that. There are countries where English is not so prominent, where other languages are much more prominent. So the basic assumption, everybody speaks English, might not work out. So be careful with that. I have no, no proper solution because uh, if, if you have a variety of countries and you need to interact with them, not all of us speak like five languages, but this general assumption, everybody speaks English, is wrong. It's simply wrong. I, I don't want to name countries specifically, but we have a couple of countries that simply uh, told us, so uh, we have one or two people as a gateway, otherwise English here is simply not existent. So be careful with that. Also brings the question if you have contracts, if, if you have anything writing with people or any, uh, like which language would a code of conduct be, you know, which languages? It's not so trivial, you need to factor it in. For us, English is fine, for others it might not, so factor in more into that. And then, of course, the practical things like time zones are great. If you coordinate with Australia or other countries, you have a lot of fun. Uh, daylight savings can be different, so this is just the, the practical thing. When the heck is our meeting? At which time? So keep that, keep that in mind. And then, again, talking about times, working with the team and pro bono <laughs> folks. You have the problem, a volunteer can mostly do work outside business hours, in evenings, during weekends. If you have a paid team, if you ask them to be present like each weekend, it's not going to fly. So you need to find somehow a balance how to match everything like that. How can uh, a team of pro bono and paid staff work together and find a meeting slot that is not disturbing the, the daily routine too much? It's not so trivial, actually. Um, there is, to me, there is no ideal scheduling. A couple of things, basic uh, things, but we learned it. Use Paul's alternate time slot so everybody at least has chance once to join uh, a meeting and uh, send calendar invites because then you have the proper time zone. It's it's basic, but we had issues several times where people did not know when a meeting starts. Even if it's written and you had the time zone conversion, send them a calendar invite. It helps actually. So how to communicate? Um, email is great. I can read and reply whenever I have time. On the phone, I need, be, need to be present immediately. But then at some point after the 500 email, it might be a problem to still follow the discussion. It might be easier to take things on the phone. So identify what is better on a phone. Identify what is better in email or chat or whatever written conversation. And for emails, we learned... If people have too many emails, and who does not, um, tag the emails, like urgent uh, vote, discussion, info, so we can pre-sort a bit. That actually helps a lot. And in general, it's absolutely fine to prepare a vote in email and conduct via phone, or the other way, discuss a, discuss a controversial topic on the phone and have the final vote via email. So you're not bound to one media continuously over the life cycle of, of a topic see what, what's better. And then you need, depending on the, the organization, you might have to meet a deadline, agenda, quorum, factor that in. For some it's relaxed. If you're like an association in Germany, you have strict rules how that has to happen. So you need to agree internally, when is our meeting deadline? When do we send the agenda out? Otherwise, what you decide might be simply void. And everything was wasted time. Trust. Trust sounds easy, but it is not, I'd say. So, at least after a certain amount of time, if you're in a role and you still don't have trust in others or you still don't feel trusted, you either run away or you don't fill the role properly. So, trust is important. Written communication is risky because you don't see the other side. Everybody has a different style of writing. And like once I had a colleague who was always to a long and nice email replying one sentence and it's like, 
don't you like me? Well, do you disagree? And then he told me, no, no. So I'm, I'm working at this company and whenever my boss is out of the room, I have like 10 seconds to reply to that email. And then it was clear, but before, I thought, what an hours? But then it was completely different. He really wanted to reply. He even like risked a debate with his boss to reply to my email. It was a completely different context, but you need to know that. A simple email, a couple of lines of text are really risky to to be interpreted. And then we all have the confirmation bias. We all assume that uh, the bad feelings we had before are now confirmed. So talk with people, try to get into exchange trust. People try to build trust. That is that is key because after a certain amount of time, it will a long time be in, in, in silence and you will not discuss about that. But there will be a point where everything will pop up and like the pain of the last five years will really break out. And that's what you really want to avoid. It takes time, energy, and it's just not leading anywhere. And then that's what we learned being based in Germany and having people worldwide. If you have a different legal setting, that can lead to some funny and obscure things because... If somebody from the US or uh, from the UK looks at Germany or the other way around, there is a ton of questions and that also might lead to, to trust issues. So try to, however complicated it is, try to translate, try to explain what is going on, what the rules are, why there are the rules, so they have a fair chance of, of getting on board and understanding and the language is, is not a barrier to that. Last, but maybe most important, reward. Reward is important. And uh, the next and last slide is simply my, my very personal list. I think everybody has their list of why they feel rewarded or what makes them feel rewarded, what they'd like to see. The, the group of people who simply like to go to a big corporation and at the end of the month have a massive paycheck and then just spend time at weekends and vacations. Others have completely different desires and you should identify if you're active in a, in a project what your personal reward is and also what you want others to see as a reward like appreciation. If you want to be appreciated, appreciate others. If you want to laud them, if you want to help them achieve a new level at their day job, do that. So um, uh, try to find out why somebody is running for a role, try to find out what makes people comfortable in contributing, what their desired reward is, and try to give it to them. Everybody has their very own um, list of things what they, they, they are really comfortable with, what they really would like to see. Try to find it out, and also important, answer this question for yourself in order to, to keep you happy and engaged in the long run. So that's That was really the, the condensed version that all originated, uh, I think, two years ago when we had a new board coming up and the question was, can you summarize a bit of what we had as experiences? And it's clearly very subjective. It's my own takes and, and, and feelings. Yours might be completely different, but I'd like to simply give it to you as a, some sort of inspiration. It depends on the setting and the organization, the size and the kind of people, fair enough. But I hope it was a bit useful. I'm happy for questions. Feel free to poke me. And uh, yeah, thanks for your patience and thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you for that talk. Um, does anyone have any questions? Thank you for your talk. Um, I'd like to go back to the very beginning uh, when you had a definition of a community, mm -hmm. and I realize that you might not be as attached to it as you know it's presented. But um, the way you know the way it's presented, it might be more descriptive than prescriptive. But I wonder if um, there is a way to hack it that would change things a little bit. So can that? Yes, thank you. A group of people with a shared identity and joint interests. I wonder if one way to present it is something like a shared, shared values and common goals. And here's why. Um, a lot of what I do is trying to bring designers into this space. And it's really difficult when uh, an identity is defined in terms of common memories, ventures, and experiences because sometimes they're just not shared, right? Sometimes it's very alienating uh, when you're referring back to some conferences you've been to years ago or there's a very obscure Star Trek reference somewhere, you know? Like, there's just ways in which a shared identity could be very exclusive. And um, 
so I wonder, like, if instead of saying shared identity, maybe there is a better way to present it as shared values, like values we all hold. Um, and similar to interests, when you call it an interest, it's often, you know, oh, we, our interest is building local for software or something, you know, some, something, you know, that people can have fun doing together. But oftentimes that means that you're only going to reach developers in that sense. Um, if you make it a common goal, say something like our goal is to, you know, destroy tech monopolies or something like that, you might find that designers are also interested in participating and even lawyers and accountants, right? Like, yeah. you know, the, the people could be, the group could be much more diverse than just developers. And so, yeah, I guess, I don't know if this is more of a question or a comment, but like, is there a way to hack the definition to make it a little bit more inclusive to different groups of people? I absolutely like the idea. So it, it's uh, really not easy. Um, when, when I was starting the talk, I was, as you see in the end, ending up uh, at Wikipedia because I like that. I, I was not able to come up with something really descriptive or really uh, that, that felt like, yep, that's it, myself. I like vision. Um, you could use also passion. It's maybe a bit too strong. It depends on the kind of people you address. But I know some in our group who are really passionate, who really like they, 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 they have that flame. They really like to do that. And um, so everything that is emotional, any, any, anything that is in an emotional sense, uh, getting there is something I like. Um, there are other people who see it more technical, and that, that's fair enough. But really this, this, um, when I made the sample with the, the friends from school, this, this emotional binding, you have something you share, whatever it's called. So vision sounds great to me. I, I like that approach, yeah, indeed, indeed. Thanks. about leadership um, and especially when you have a, like a group of volunteers maybe not like full-timers or paid people like leaders also have to do difficult things like in a company sometimes like letting people go uh, like what's the equivalent where or did you ever run to into a situation where you actually had somebody in your community where you said well we actually don't want to work with you anymore so luckily we never had to go that far we were always close to like really talking to people saying your behavior or how you approach the other person is not appropriate so at least i'm not aware of a a major issue luckily but my take unfortunately is it was just not discovered i can't imagine after that amount of time with that group of people nothing ever happened so that's why on one hand i'm happy on the other end i'm sure there was something um, but at least we have complicated times we have to talk to people and it gets even more complicated if they are friends and and you know you have those those two hats on one hand that like so what's happening here is simply not gonna work out on the other hand like i'm a friend of you so what the heck is going on um, and that is not so easy. What we usually do is um, trying to find out, to sound out who is probably best in a project, a person who speaks the same language or who's, you know, same mindset, whom would they trust? That helps a lot. It's not always smooth and easy, um, of course, but that's the way we, we try to handle it. Um, and we do have complicated people on, on various um, occasions of course but we try for example when when there are, when, when there are people known to run around and and uh, annoy people to say it very friendly to uh, make clear so if there's a problem here's a couple of trusted people you can contact maybe not in a code of conduct sense but like if that person pops up um I know them quite well. Please poke me. I'm happy to talk. Don't don't try to get into that warm. I'm happy to to call and 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 solve the problem or talk to them. So this is some sort of I'd say internal knowledge that we have, which of course is risky if some people leave, then that knowledge is gone. But um, that's how we at the moment try to address it. Uh, but we're eager to improve on that as well. So code of conduct is one of the topics that we have formed, but there are discussions to uh, improve on that. I think this is key. Um, the more communities grow, the more they include people who are simply different from the core group, That the more important that is, I think. And uh, But as you can imagine, and maybe some of you went through that, it's not an easy discussion at all, <laughs> not at all. Thank you for the talk. My question also goes into a similar direction, I think, as, as your question. 
Um, when you define diversity, you mentioned um, like different people in different jobs, different age, different culture, but you didn't mention, for example, um, like gender, for example, which uh, no, no worries about that, but uh, I was just curious because I read, a, uh, read on Twitter the other day that, well, the amount of, for example, women in tech is, is much lower than men, but it's even much, much, much lower, much fewer percentage. Um, uh, the relationship is like more off in, in open source. Um, where there are very few women. So I was just curious, do you have, uh, it's a tough question, but do you have an explanation for that and what do you think could, could a community do to address this issue? Yeah, so indeed, the, um, th that list is also not conclusive. It was indeed on purpose because with that you open a, a really massive discussions that I really don't have proper answers for. I, I share your findings. Um, what we did is to... Um, discussed that we had a, a workshop uh, two conferences ago to how to improve on it. it it's a very small first step obviously and um, it's um, not a trivial topic it's a very heated emotional topic and that these are always yeah re really really problematic to 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 talk through i have not a real explanation uh, i perceive the same i mean if we look at uh, our board uh, if you look at our membership base it's easy if you look at the gender the uh, the, the percentage is is clear it's exactly what you say we see it with the conferences and we we try our first steps there i would say to to improve um, we could do clearly much better um, but then it really is a question how to, to work on that. So also the opinions there are different. And I, I think it's so fragile if, if you move in a, in a, at least publicly in a, in a certain direction, you might break things. I'm, I don't know. It, I perceive everybody is really careful, um, fully aware of the problem. Clear we should solve that. And luckily we do have a couple of really dedicated and, and passionate people driving that and I hope to see much more outcome because we perceive the same. And I, I sadly have no no perfect answer as to why we see that and, and how to solve that. I, I hear many opinions, but I I can't combine all of them to one. They are they are different. That makes it a bit trivial. If everybody is going the same direction, it's easy if you have opposing opinions then it's problematic and I'm, I'm not the expert in that field and that makes it really challenging I have to say but I'm willing to learn clearly. Uh, any more questions? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh,